When I was young, or mm, at least younger, there was a bumper sticker on Cars in America, the one who dies with the most toys wins. Now, this was a kind of a joke, but it was a sick joke, because it was pointing out the meaninglessness of consumer consumption society. Well, then climate change hits. And as a young person, what do I do with my life? What's the meaning of life? You have to cope with climate change. The project has been handed to you. It's a bit of a crisis. It's overwhelming. It's frightening. But for sure, it's not meaninglessness anymore. Dit is Kim Stanley Robinson, een van de bekendste science fiction schrijvers ter wereld. In zijn profetische boek The Ministry for the Future beschrijft Robinson hoe de mensheid de klimaatcrisis oplost in enkele tientallen jaren. En nu, slechts vijf jaar nadat Robinson het boek schreef, lijkt het te worden ingehaald door de werkelijkheid. There's a hunger for a story that tells about us getting through these next decades without catastrophe. And so when it came out and was being spread by word of mouth, by the suggestion of Obama and others, it, um, it's been picked up and passed around as if it will help people to imagine a, a positive future. We are going to be in a chaotic and violent next few decades. There's going to be a lot of bad news and there's going to be a lot of fearful complaining and uh, remonstrations and giving up. And yet, good things might be happening anyway. And so the novel tries to tell that story, that even without a plan, even with disasters happening, which they will, and even with a lot of people fighting hard to make the situation worse, we still could get to a good place. And that what I think people find interesting, that we don't need superheroes, that there isn't going to be any um, salvation from above, that we're going to have to do it ourselves, and it's going to feel messy, and it might even feel like defeat Defeat, defeat, defeat after defeat, and then at the end of the process, you could still say, ah, oh, that, that's a victory. We, somehow, we did it. De mensheid die het klimaatprobleem oplost. Hoe ziet dat eruit? Het begint met een ramp. Een enorme hittegolf in India eist miljoenen slachtoffers. In the morning, the sun rose like the blazing furnace of heat that it was. Frank put on a white shirt. The quickly soaked up his sweat. He looked at his phone. 38 degrees. He walked out into the street. Moving in the sunlight was like getting pushed towards a bonfire. Four more people died that night. Every rooftop, and looking down at the town, every sidewalk too, was now a morgue. The town was a morgue. And it was as hot as ever. In your book, there's a major heat wave where 20 million Indians die. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose India? Well, India is particularly vulnerable to uh, humid heat. Those uh, combinations of heat and humidity are fatal to humans uh, if you're exposed to it without air conditioning. And indeed, you could be indoors in the shade, uh, wearing no clothes, with a fan on you, and still die of overheating when the humidity is high enough. So these are dangerous times for everybody. Uh, but India also has a whole lot of people. And the back wall of the Himalayas means that heat waves can be trapped against Uttar Pradesh um, for a uh, long period of time and get particularly hot and humid, which it already does. And they don't have the best electrical grid uh, potential for um, when stressed like this, the electrical grid could go out. The book was constructed with a heavy element of exposition and of argumentation. And they're there to kind of um, support the, the feeling of the real, that, oh, this really could happen. I needed to put in all that kind of material to uh, bolster the reader's uh, confidence that something like this could really happen. In 
In that year, the events in India and Southeast Asia and in the American Midwest killed so many more people than the first pandemic that it was made clear to everyone that things simply had to change. The question at that desperate point was, could things change? Could humanity stop its destructive ways and restore balance to its relationship to its biosphere? Looking back from our perspective 60 years later, this of course looks possible because they did it, but it was by no means a sure thing. You have to imagine what it felt like at the time when panic filled the air and no one could be sure success was even physically possible. Many declared that humanity was doomed. When I wrote this book in 2019, there was not a sense of urgency. It was on the back burner. It was a, another generation's problem. When I wrote the book, I was much angrier and much more without hope. Now everybody's much more aware of climate change as an immediate problem than they were in 2019. Crucially, the people of that time had to arrange to pay themselves to do the things necessary to heal the biosphere. Money had to go to good work rather than bad. This was the crux. With that change enacted, there was all manner of good work ready to be performed. The mechanism for this transformation was called the Network for Greening the Financial System, an organization of 89 of the world's central banks. These central banks shifted the world to what some now call the carbon standard. It also gets called carbon quantitative easing or the carbon coin. The idea was this, that new fiat money should be created precisely in proportion to the amount of carbon dioxide taken out of the atmosphere and sequestered in plants, soil or the rocks under our feet. And that new money was to be given to anyone who drew carbon back out of the air. This monetary and fiscal policy reoriented a huge proportion of human work to decarbonizing projects. And there were a lot of them ready to go. So, finance is strange. In central banks, the money that we have, we regard as real, central banks have made it up from scratch, right from the start. They print it, but also they change numbers. Um, it's the, the laws, the legal system, the armies that defend the reality of that money, and so everybody trusts it. And in a modern world that works on the capitalist system, nothing matters except profit, quarterly profit and shareholder value. Well, that's a distortion. If you need a sewage system, the market says, well, tough luck. And indeed, a lot of the world therefore has to go without sewage because the market doesn't care because it doesn't make them a profit. So at that point, government has to say, we are the bank of last resort. We make money, we make trust, and we're gonna, we're gonna build a sewage system because it's needed and people will then support that. The people will say, yeah, I'd like a police force, I'd like schools, I'd like an airport, I'd like a working sewage system. Then it's not like the central bankers are superheroes. They're just the ordinary people, indeed often boring. They're in the right structural position in our society. I want to show you a little clip. Naast het toezicht op banken heeft de ECB nog een machtsmiddel in handen. Om de economie te stimuleren koopt het nog altijd maandelijks voor tientallen miljarden obligaties op. Ook van olie- en gasbedrijven. Het opkoopprogramma van de ECB mag de markt niet verstoren. Maar met het oog op het klimaat onderzoeken de centrale bankiers in Frankfurt nu toch of ze groene bedrijven kunnen voortrekken. Het is echt wel ingewikkeld. Uh, kan je... Uh, in de opkoopprogramma's die we doen, waar we dus, dus, dus obligaties opkopen... kan je daar uh, uh, zeggen van, nou, we kopen daar niet meer van alles... net zoveel als er wordt aangeboden, zou je ongeveer kunnen zeggen. Maar gaan we daar, in het Engels zeg je tilten, dus gaan we wat overhellen richting groen. So what do you think? Ja, yeah, it's, it's good, I like it. In the three years since I wrote the book, I've discovered many things that I didn't know when I wrote the book that confirm the, the idea of a carbon coin. Yeah, actually, this was a clip of 2021, so they already started. Uh, yeah, yeah. That is excellent news. I am a little surprised because one thing I've noticed that I worry about is it seems as if they're all looking at each other. Okay, we're all ready to go. We all have goodwill. Who's going to go first? And specifically, who's going to start paying first? 
So if there are indeed programs that are uh, being started, maybe someone's taken the first step. It's bold, it's admirable. Op het gebied van financiën lijkt de werkelijkheid Robinsons scenario te volgen. Maar Robinson voorziet ook geweld. Hij beschrijft een groep mensen die wraak neemt in naam van de slachtoffers van klimaatverandering. Ecoterroristen, zonder genade. They killed us, so we killed them. Everyone in our cell had helped to clean up after the heatwave. You don't forget a thing like that. It was a question of identifying the guilty and then finding them and getting to them. Of course, suicide bombing is often effective, but this is a crude and ugly way to go about it. Most of us didn't want to do it. We weren't that crazy, and we wanted to be more effective than that. Much better to kill and disappear. Then you could do it again. There are going to be people extremely angry, and there's also going to be careless people who think they're cool, and by hurting other people, they think they're doing good. They never are. And my book does not make the implication, or maybe it, I should say it doesn't explicitly say, that um, hurting people helps the cause. I think it always hurts the cause. But it, it will happen, and the novel is somewhat um, non-judgmental in that it just throws all this on you, the reader, to decide, well, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? But at no point does any narrator or even care, well, there are characters who claim, I'm doing the right thing, this is justice. There are other characters who say, no, terrible idea. And the reader has to sort that out. The one that I thought when I wrote it was most unlikely to happen was that we would save giant tracts of land in habitat corridors so that the wild animals could come back in peace. It was E.O. Wilson, it was half Earth, it was the most utopian aspect of ministry for the future. And then last year they legislated it in the, the COP15 meeting in Montreal that China ran in Canada. And it became reality. That blew my mind. So even though for me when I wrote it, it was like, okay, we'll throw in even the extra good stuff. Like, even that's coming true. So that was quite a surprise. Many people have said, oh, I read the book and it gave me hope. Or I like it when people say, um, I already work in a ministry for the future. And like sometimes they're preschool teachers. They mean that if you work for the generations to come, then you're doing a ministry for the future type job. Ga even kijken wat ga je vandaag doen. Maar je gaat wel nuttig je tijd besteden. Dat is het allerbelangrijkste. And there's there must be thousands of diplomats for whom it's literally true, and then uh, millions who are already doing this kind of work. And with and when they recognize that my book is a symbol for a larger. Movement. I like that very much. The hope van Nederland is dat de mensen hun land terugkrijgen, dat die Nederlander weer op één komt te staan. You can say we're all on this one planet together. We are one planet, one species. We've got to cooperate. We've got to deal. Or you can say. It's not going to work and I'm going to retreat to my own country, my own region, my own language group. I'm going to put up a big wall and I'm going to pretend that that solves the problem. It's simpler. You don't have to trust other people as much. It's so you see the right wing, xenophobic, my country first and over everybody else and be damned to climate change. We don't care. Ministerio de las Mujeres y Género y Diversidad, afuera. Ministerio de Educación, adoctrinamiento, afuera. But that's the ostrich putting their head in the sand solution. Climate change will hit them too. You cannot escape it. So you can take the crappy, cowardly way out and say, oh, I only trust the, the people who speak my language or my immediate family. Or you can take the generous way and the, the courageous way and say, okay, now we have to trust each other. So there is a meaningful, righteous cause 
that everybody not only can throw themselves into, but they kind of have to, if they want a world to persist for the generations to come, and if they want the other species to survive. It's a global effort. It's laws fighting in court. It's demonstrations. It's breaking pipelines rather than killing people. Despite the terrifying aspect of it, it is also a good thing to draw people together into a common global cause. Remarkable things can happen in, at all levels. Reality is changing faster than humans can keep up with it. And I wrote this book in 2019. Four years later, I have a lot more hope that we can get to a good conclusion. Mm -hmm.